Promotional consideration paid for by the following. You already know about Magic Spoon, the cereal that's changing the game. Each cereal has zero sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs per serving, all at just 140 calories per serving. With so many great tastes like honey nut, cookies and cream, blueberry muffin, and more, there's a lot of flavor without a lot of extra carbs or sugar. Now you can take Magic Spoon anywhere with their cereal bars, cookies and cream, and cocoa peanut butter. It's all the great flavor of one established product in a slightly different bit of pan. Packaging, just like me. Wait a minute, you can actually eat those? Give me that. Ah! Add some delicious cereal bars to your Magic Spoon variety pack, backed by their 100% happiness money back guarantee. Click the link below and use the code REGRET or go to magicspoon.com slash regret to get five bucks off. So hey, big bro, you give any thought into buying into a Bayance coin? One step ahead of you, bro. As we are now in the month of July, I decided the next couple of classic pay-per-view reviews would center on some historic great American bash shows over the decades, and this week's episode is definitely a doozy from a historical context. Time to look at the NWA Great American Bash 1990 New Revolution from July 7th at the Baltimore Arena in Baltimore, Maryland. This show was nominated by Paul Hutchison, Wesley Landon Woolsey, and Didymus over at patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret. As I often mention with this company, it is a curious time in the timeline of the NWA and WCW. Ole Anderson's recently been given the booking duties for the company and is starting to bring back wrestlers who really helped define the previous decade, though who are now transitioning more and more into people who are trying to help build up the younger generation. Meanwhile, world champion Ric Flair is growing increasingly frustrated with his position in the company and dealing with Jim Hurd, but before he can eventually leave, he's got to do business and pass the torch to Sting, who's now finally healthy enough for it. A lot of different reported attendance numbers for this show, depending on what source you look at. Some say it's 8,900, some say it's 10,000, some say it's 14,000. Who's to say? But the show did reportedly get about 200,000 pay-per-view buys. Jim Ross and Bob Cottle are your commentary team here. Look at this intro, I love it. To tie in with the Revolutionary War theme, Sting and Flair and the Horsemen are, you know, drawn or whatever the 1990 equivalent was to Photoshopping onto these Revolutionary War paintings. I love it. Your opening match sees the Nature Boy, Buddy Landell versus Flyin' Brian. The last time we talked about Landell here in this channel, he had just won the national championship from Terry Taylor, then fucked himself out of a job due to his out of the ring dalliances with substances. So he's on a bit of a comeback tour here, but man, Jim Ross on commentary in the build on TV in the weeks leading up to this cannot stop burying the hell out of him for what he did in the past. Like, oh, he's a great competitor. Oh, he's got a lot of issues and stuff. He's got bad habits and stuff. We're hoping to work that out. But man, he's a great wrestler. Oh, but man, he loves the blow too much. Like, he just can't stop burying him. I've seen him at varying stages of his career, the highs and the lows. But Landell has always had great ability. His training habits have not been the best. His out-of-ring exploits are somewhat legendary. Definitely considered one of the established superstars of our sport if he hadn't tried to self-destruct. To be quite frank, I'm surprised he's lived as long as he has. Production botched to open the show as they both get blank name keys. Both men start off with some big rights. Pillman with a cross body as Landell begging off. A big drop kick has the nature boy going to the outside. Landell must pose. Back in the ring, Buddy with a slap and he hides in the ropes. Thumb to the eye has Landell taking control. He even catches the second cross body attempt in midair. Pillman goes for a big drop kick but got none of it. Brian fires back up, gets the corner punches, gets cut off again. Buddy with cutoff after cutoff. We get a couple double downs after a vertical suplex, then a collision out of the corner. Pillman is knocked out of the ring, but he's able to recover, leaps off the top rope with a cross body to win. I'm going to give this one three stars out of five. I liked the pace to this opening match here on the show. Landell, despite his issues, which surprisingly they don't really bring up on commentary for the pay-per-view, uh, I think he was still really good at this point. I love the back and forth between the two of them here, the hope spots that Pillman had, and the cutoffs and the way they built to the finish. I 
that was really well done. You know, Buddy's return to the NWA was short-lived. He would be out of the company uh, by the end of the year. Gordon Soley is reporting from the stage area. We'll hear from him between each match. Up next, Captain Mike Rotunda takes on the Iron Sheik, who I totally forgot ever worked for WCW around this time. Like, when I saw it in action here, I was reminded, oh yeah, that's right, he did have a cup of coffee here, but I forgot that it was for this show in particular. And it's crazy to think, you know, he's a former WWF champion, former tag team champion there, and then within a year from this, or a year, maybe less than that, he's going to be part of Sergeant Slaughter's entourage when he was the Iraqi sympathizer back in the WWF. So it's crazy what the difference a couple of years in either direction makes. The Sheik jumps Rotunda with the Iranian flag and chokes him to get the early advantage, which Jim Ross describes later in the match as a terrorist attack. Sunset flip by Mike, but Sheik kicks out. Sheiky baby powders, there's a familiar phrase. Sheik dodging the elbow and begins to take over. Lots of begging off when Mike gets a flurry going, but it's stopped once again. Sheik going for a suplex. It's countered into a backslide and the pinfall victory for Cap'n Mike. This gets one and a half stars out of five for me. Not a great match. Of course, Sheik is on the downturn of his career at this point. You know, this is years before Grand Masters of Wrestling when he was really falling off. So it's, it's sad to see the decline he was having here around this time. You know, thank God he had someone who was actually nimble like Mike Rotunda as an opponent for this matchup. I will say though, I thought the finish for this, like the counter from the suplex into the backslide, not really, I haven't really seen that kind of counter done before. I thought it was pretty creative. Gordon Soley is in the interview zone with Harley Race and asked him about wildfire Tommy Rich. He says he'll take care of Rich later on, then gives his predictions for the main event. He says Sting will win if Flair was not up to the challenge, and he adds that most of his predictions in wrestling have come true. Up next, the world's strongest man, Doug Furness, takes on Dirty Dutch Mantell. The two trade headlocks. Mantell bails out of the ring in the early going. A lot of running the ropes and leapfrogging ends with Furness military pressing Dutch up and down. More locking up, Dutch with some slaps in the corner. Doug gets one of his own and it's coming back. A big unnecessary backflip out of the corner. Furness picks things up with a cross body and an arm drag. Dutch with the eye rake and he begins to take over with some more sneaky attacks. Furness comes back, goes for a top rope splash and gets gets none of it. The cover, but Doug emphatically kicks out. Mantell takes over on the outside, goes for another cover back in the ring, gets launched again, this time into the ref. Using tights for leverage in an arm bar gets caught. Doug comes back, hits a power slam off the ropes. Then things get a little awkward. Let's hit it again. One more time off the ropes. Mantell's easily confused, walks into a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, and Furnace wins. I give this match two and a half stars out of five. It felt like ultimately just an inconsequential mid-card match. Not a lot of build to this on TV in particular, and so I didn't really feel like there was much of a reason for this thing. It was almost a little too much shtick for my liking by Mantell. The whole repeatedly powdering out of the ring and stuff, I think that's definitely, it was a product of the style of the time. It works in small doses, but it almost took me out of it here, I'd say. Still, it was some good back and forth action. I love Mantell's work in this thing as just the dastardly heel and everything. As far as Furnace goes, he wouldn't be long for the NWA working like this, but he would, of course, find his greatest success just uh, not too long after this in Japan, especially All Japan Pro Wrestling. Just two years after this, he would take part in a match of the year as voted by by the readers of the Wrestling Observer. Gordon Soley interviews James E. Cornette. He cuts a great promo on the Southern Boys and he wants them to ask themselves if they're mean and tough enough to beat the Midnight Express. He says they may be champions one day, but not this day. Up next, Wildfire Tommy Rich and Harley Race, two former world champs squaring off here. Race making his return to WCW after a brief stint in Puerto Rico. I love the fast pace to start this match. I love Harley's headlock takeover bump. I've never seen one quite like that before. Race spiking Tommy with a pile driver. Interesting bounce up and sell. The fight makes its way to the ramp. We get a big suplex by Race. On the outside, Rich fights back in a big body slam on the floor. He's making his comeback in the ring. Both men go over the top rope, back to the outside. Rich the top rope cross body, but Harley rolls through with the cover and wins. I give it two stars out of five. I wish this match had gone a little bit longer because I really like the physicality in this thing. And even though both men, especially Harley, were getting up there in age, I still think they had a lot of good chemistry here. These two have, of course, worked before over the World Championship, for instance. You know, it's kind of surprising that Rich would lose to Race here, considering, like, you know, he is the older guy and the, the, the modus operandi in WCW at this time definitely seems to be toward more like pushing the younger talent. And you know, like I said, Rich is no spring chicken at this point, but he's still, I think, more viable of a talent than Harley Race was at this point. R uh, Rich, during this run in the NWA, was repeatedly booked as kind of like always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Good for mid-card storyline 
lines, good for TV wins, but ultimately kind of like choking or not getting the big wins when it counted here. You know, he was never able to regain the heights of him being world champion, and this just like didn't even come close. And what's ironic is Race would actually retire fully by the end of this year after suffering a shoulder injury. Gordon Sully's on stage with Polly Dangerously and Mean Mark Dangerously says that Mean Mark is the heir apparent to the world title after Sting is knocked out of contention tonight. Dangerously pulls out a Lex Luger t-shirt, or maybe it's toilet paper, he says. He says that if Luger dares to flex at Mark like he does in this t-shirt, then Mark will rip Lex's head off and spit down his throat. Up next, a match for the NWA US Tag Team Championships as the Midnight Express defend against the wild-eyed Southern boys of Steve Armstrong and Tracy Smothers. Those two making their pay-per-view debut here. The action gets started right away, throwing Bobby Eaton hither and yon before things start to slow down. Bobby is a bump machine for Armstrong and Smothers in the early going. Stan Lane comes in. He and Tracy have a martial arts face-off. Lane starting off strong, but Tracy firing back. A misdirection sends the Midnight Express flying all over the place, and Jim Cornette freaking out on the outside. JC distracts the ref while Smothers is thrown over the top rope, and Midnight takes over. Bobby with the Alabama jam to Smothers. After a few more minutes of heat, Tracy with a double sunset flip, making the hot tag to Armstrong. A double team move to Lane, but Smothers isn't leaving the ring in time. Steve goes up top, but Eaton shoves him off. The rocket launcher, but somehow a kick out at two. Smothers and Armstrong use twin magic that almost gets them the win. The referee's distracted, laying with a kick to the back of Smothers' head. The small package, Midnight Express, win and retain. This is my pick for the match of the night. Yes, even more so than the main event here. It's, you know, this show is really full of good tag team wrestling. I think most of the, the positives in this show are in those matches, I would say. They told a great story here. I love the pace and the athleticism they showed here. Such a stark contrast to some of the matches we saw earlier in this show, like with the Iron Sheik or Harley Race. These guys are on a whole different level, and watching them uh, wrestle here was a great breath of fresh air compared to what we've seen so far on this show. Gordon Sully with the fabulous Freebirds who are all glammed up for the occasion. Jimmy Jam says the Steiners and Baltimore will never be the same after tonight. Michael Hayes says they've come to rock the house, and there's two things the Steiners can do about it, nothing and like it. Up next, the Z-Man, not me, taking on the debuting Big Van Vader. Bob Cottle describing Vader's headgear as a samurai warrior headpiece of some kind that emits steam. Vader on the attack early, showing the strength by pulling Z-Man over the ropes. Zank with one of his only offensive maneuvers of the match, and it gets him nothing, only hastens the destruction. Big military press, a line, and a big splash, and that's all she wrote. I give it one star out of five. It is a quick squash match, but it is emphatic uh, for a squash match for sure, and a great way to debut Vader. I think that when he comes out here, the fans like, don't know what to make of him, and then like when the steam comes out of the headgear for his entrance, the fans like light up for it, and I think they really gravitate to him right away. He's so dominant in this thing. It's hard not to appreciate it. We get the Horsemen on stage with Gordon Soley. You got Barry Windham, Sid Vicious, and Arn Anderson with Ole in their corner. They're going to take out Eligante and the Dudes with Attitudes, and they also promise that Ric Flair will retain the World Championship in the main event. Up next, the fabulous Freebirds take on Rick and Scott, the Steiner brothers, who've only been teaming for less than a year at this point, but are already one of the hottest acts in the company. Hayes goes for the DDT early on, but Scott blocks it. Rick throws some Steiner lines, then Scott hits them both on the outside. And okay, look, I understand the Freebirds are dressed very flamboyantly. They have the sequined overalls, they are just caked in makeup and covered in glitter. I understand what they're going for here, and it definitely works, because you've got a whole bunch of people in this audience chanting a huge homophobic slur at them, to the point where we get a big old shot of a whole front row of dudes chanting it at them. It's all in full view, and not to mention the audible chants we hear throughout this match are definitely something. Needless to say, I am not watching the Peacock version of this show. Someone tell me if that stuff's cut out from that version, because I would imagine it is. So the Freebirds are called a homophobic slur, but Rick Steiner gets a babyface pop for biting P.S. Hayes' ass. Make it make sense. The Freebirds powder, we get a lot of stalling. Scotty with a big suplex to Hayes and a tilt a whirl slam to Garvin. Some more shtick, we get a Michael is a bitch chant. Rick Steiner gets double teamed by the Birds. Garvin with a couple of clotheslines on the outside. Rick gets worked over a while, goes to body slam Garvin, but then something happens that causes Garvin to reverse it. I'm not quite sure what happened here. Jimmy Jarm Gavin goes for a flying nothing, but Rick stops it, hits a flying something, and we get a double down. Frankensteiner to Hayes, Garvin with a DDT, but he's not the legal man, and as the ref chastises him, Rick suplexes Michael. Scott covers and wins. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. Like the Doug Furness Dutch Mantel match, I thought there was almost a little too much shtick, a little too much stalling and wasting time for my liking, and also, it can be hard to focus on 
on this match because some of the chance we get here can be very alarming but once you get past those things it's actually still a pretty good match the Steiners like I said they've been a team for less than a year at this point but they're already stupid over they're already former tag team champions so it's definitely a hot act and uh, you got the Freebirds who are just natural heat magnets with or without their face their, their makeup and their sequins and everything and uh, yeah still told for a good story we get a little promo for the upcoming Halloween Havoc 1990 which who boy that's gonna get covered here eventually then we go to a six-man tag match as the Horsemen, Barry Windham, Arn Anderson, and Sid Vicious take on the Dudes with Attitudes. It's Paul Orndorff, the Junkyard Dog, and Ellie Gante making his national wrestling debut. Well, it's no less random of a bunch of teammates than, say, Darby Allen and Shingo Takagi. Windham and Sid are the newest members of the Horsemen. They were brought into the group shortly after Sting was excommunicated earlier in the year. Sid with a strength on display on Orndorff right out the gate, but Mr. Wonderful gets a big run. The backslide assisted by JYD and we get a two count. We get the big face off and the horsemen run off when Eligante gets in the ring. Arn gets in the fray now, gets bopped around by the baby faces. Great selling by Arn here. Look at that face after he runs from Eligante. We get it again with Wyndham, but not quite as good as Arn. Wyndham drops JYD with a DDT, but it's got no effect. Orndorff tags back in and is beating up everyone in sight. Wyndham cuts off the pile driver. A we want Sid chant from the crowd. The big man makes it back in for a moment. Orndorff takes the heat for a bit, but tags in the dog. We can't see why he just faves Igante in the corner there. The horsemen triple team JYD and throw him over the top. That's a DQ. Igante chases the horsemen away, which then gets booed. Rightfully so. I'm going to give this one two stars out of five. I think it was great work for five of the six men involved in this thing. I thought the heels sold spectacularly for everyone, especially Eligante. Disappointing DQ finish here. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that we say that because it's disappointing on one level because, you know, the fans are promised, hey, Eligante is going to wrestle and you don't get that. It's, it's very just unofficial when he's in the ring. You don't really see him do anything. So it's disappointing they kind of like pulled back on something they promised the fans. But then again, they were probably doing us a favor because I don't think anyone really wants to see what happens when Ellie Conte eventually wrestles. We all know what's going to happen in hindsight. It's just they know what's go they know the truth. They're delaying the inevitable. They don't want to really have the big man actually wrestle yet, but the anticipation for it is getting fans riled up. Gordon Soley's on stage with the U.S. champ Lex Luger. In response to what Paul dangerously said earlier he says it's a lot easier to tear a t-shirt than to tear him apart he also adds that he's friends with sting and that he's never seen him more fired up and ready than he is tonight and is sure that his friend will win the world championship in a battle of the alliterative names for the U.S. Championship, Lex Luger defends against Mean Mark. Look at Mean Mark Callis here. He's a blank canvas in 1990. Of course, accompanied by Paul E. Dangerously. And watching this stuff here, every time I see this pairing from this era, I just can't help but think of the history that these two have had. Paul Heyman, The Undertaker, and how their stories would be intertwined so much, not just in the early 90s, but in the years following that, in the, in the mid-2000s, for instance, and seeing that history there kind of play out in a very different way here. It's very fascinating. We get holds and counter holds by both guys here to start off. Both guys run on the ropes. Lex with a cross body, followed up by an arm drag. Look at the height, the elevation by Mean Mark on that leapfrog before the boot. Ooh, what do you call the old school before its current school? Do you call it preschool? Luger begins to fight back, but Mark dodges the attack and Luger hurls himself over the top rope. Back inside, Luger with some hope spots, but Mark snuffs them out. Vertical suplex leads to Lex lexing up, throwing some big clotheslines. The torture racks applied, very impressive. The referee is kicked in the head, and that gives Paul E. the chance to deck Luger with the cell phone, but Luger kicks out. Mark goes with a heart punch, but Luger avoids it. He decks dangerously, hits the clothesline to win the match. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars out of five. The match got a little one-dimensional to me, a little bit punchy. You don't want to step up to punchy, in my opinion, and this match definitely did that. But I think Lex Luger, I think, did a good job looking like a baby face in peril. I think Mean Mark was a good foil. Like just, it's, it's, it's rare to find somebody like bigger than Lex Luger and for Luger to be that baby face it just feels like kind of an odd place for him to be but I think that he pulls that off really well here I think Mean Mark I think is a great foil for him in this matchup in a pre-recorded interview Gordon Soley's backstage with Sting how's he feel going into the world title match with Flair Sting says he's feeling good the knee is strong he wants no interference no excuses Sting is ready to walk that aisle in our next match for the world tag team titles Doom accompanied by Theodore R. Long defending against the Rock and Roll Express. Ron Simmons and Butch Reed, they won the tag belt back in May at Capital Combat, the return of RoboCop. If you want to hear more about Capital Combat, you can click this link right here and get my review. Robert Gibson able to use his quickness against the size and strength of Simmons and Reed. 
some double teaming by r, &R here, but Reed blocks the hip toss, hits a big old clothesline to take over. Gibson taking a lot of offense, gets thrown over the top as the ref is not looking. Gibson gets the breather and tags in Morton. Simmons decks Ricky with a clothesline. Now it's Ricky's turn to do the Ricky Morton thing and sell a lot. Butch Reed with a second rope elbow drop to Morton who kicks out. Ricky's still fighting, going for pins, doing what he can to survive here. Morton's dumped out of the ring again. Doom continued to work him over. Reed just muscles up Ricky for a power slam. Morton gets the knees up on a splash, finally makes a tag to Gibson. He's a house of fire. All four men in the ring now. Teddy Long is on the apron and ends a Guri to Reed, who takes one of the most convoluted staggers into Long. Gibson decks Long, but he walks right into a top rope tackle by Butch. Doom win and retain. For whatever reason, it feels the crowd was like really quiet for both the hot tags, especially the Ricky to Robert one, which really confused me. I'm not sure if it had something to do with the market. Maybe Rock and Roll Express did better in the South than in Baltimore. I'm not entirely sure on that, but I think that whole, the lack of pop for those hot tags especially surprised me. And also, R&R uh, &R didn't get to do a lot of, in my opinion, what made them so popular and successful in the first place. We had a little bit of double team stuff with them, but we didn't get all that flash that we usually get with Rock and Roll Express. Another pre-taped interview with Gordon Soley and Ric Flair, the six-time world champ. Flair says he's wearing a $2,000 custom suit to celebrate the presumptive victory. He puts over Sting and the hard work he's gone through to get to where he is, but to be the man, he has to beat the man. And we go to that main event now for the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. The Nature Boy, Ric Flair, defends against Sting. Way back in February, Sting was kicked out of the Four Horsemen for wanting to challenge Flair for the championship. It was meant to kickstart the title run and eventual passing of the torch because that was the story. It was that Ric Flair promised that he would pass the torch to Sting. He would be the man. But the same night Sting was kicked out of the Horsemen, later in the night he tore his Patel attendant in a post-match angle. It was on the shelf for months. That is partly what led to what we saw at Capital Combat with Sting's buddy Robocop, Sting has made it his mission to start shit with the Horsemen every chance he gets until he's finally healed up and gets his title match. He's got his own team now, the Dudes with Attitudes, as previously mentioned. You got the Steiners, got Paul Orndorff, the Junkyard Dog. This is the team that Sting has assembled to kind of counteract the Horsemen's bad stuff. The Dudes are stationed at ringside to combat the Horsemen should they try to interfere. And not only that, the cherry on top, Ole Anderson has to be handcuffed to Ellie Gante on the ramp during the match. And okay, People talk shit about Oli as a booker or as just a human being or whatever, but man, I cannot help but smile and enjoy Oli's work during this run as the manager, the mouthpiece of the horseman. His acting around Eligante especially is what's, it's what's doing it for me. I love the performance here. I love Sting's look here, that iconic red, white, and blue look to go with the Great American Bash theme. Flair hitting the chops, no effect on the Stinger early on who hits the big press slam, slams him on the ramp and clotheslines him back into the ring. Flair virtually cripples Sting with the single dreaded eye poke hits a suplex, but Sting shakes it off again, hits the cross body. Flair begins to go after Sting's leg. We get another standoff here. Flair with a sneak attack during the test of strength. He attacks the leg, but Sting counters, puts his own figure four in the champ. Sting is thrown into the railing, but he stings up again briefly. More back and forth. Sting sends Flair flying over the turnbuckle, hits the Stinger splash, goes for the Scorpion Deathlock. Out come the horsemen, but those dudes with attitudes head him off of the pass. We get a rope break by Flair. Rick going for a cheap pin, but Scott Steiner puts a stop to that. He probably said, ah, fuck you, when he did it. Sting goes for a flying knee, but it must have been so big an impact the camera had to cut away. Flair is all like, it's time! He goes to the figure four, but Sting hits the inside cradle, pins and wins, beats Flair. The 426 day reign has been snapped, and the torch has been passed as the rest of the dudes celebrate with the Stinger. And then Sting's face suddenly burns an effigy on the stage. Sting remains humble in his post-match promo and promises as champion he'll do the best he can do and that's how we end the Great American Bash. I give this match three and a half stars out of five. I think it told a great story, had a very cathartic conclusion to see Sting finally get that moment that was, you know, been promised and been expected for so long. You had that build going in the first part of the year. You had to put it on ice for a while because the injury, making this moment here that much sweeter. There are times in the match where I question the psychology of things, like Sting doing the Sting up like once or twice in a match at pivotal points is okay, but it felt like he was just throwing him in there just at random at points where it's like, okay, it's kind of 
of losing its oomph every time it does it. And uh, still, I thought it was a well-executed matchup. A little bit of Gaga on the outside with the horsemen and the dudes, but not so much that it takes away from what we saw in the match itself. So yeah, solid main event, and of course, very historical for a lot of reasons. My grade for the 1990 Great American Bash is a C+. I think it was overall a good representation of what WCW had at the time, which was overall positive. You had a lot of amazing talent at that time in the company, not always used in the best way, but I think you did have that talent there. Uh, it's interesting to me that most of the matches that I think are worth their weight and salt, that are worth watching back on this show, are the tags, especially Midnight Express versus Southern Boys, uh, except for the six-man tag. It's the one tag match I would say to stay away from on this show. Obviously, this is a very historical pay-per-view. It's the debut of Vader. It's the coronation of Sting, the rise of some future stars, uh, you know, you will see here. Definitely, there is some stuff worth checking out here, but there's a lot of the mid-card, in particular the singles matches in the mid-card, that to me leave a lot to be desired. So in two weeks' time, we're looking back at another classic Great American Bash, but we are jumping way, way far ahead into the timeline when WWE was running this show, and this show is going to be remembered for something very different than, say, a passing of the torch or a coronation. I got three words for you. Elevated liver enzymes. We're looking at the Great American Bash 2006. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.